Support the Amigos podcast and keep the Amiga goodness flowing for just a dollar a month. Visit our page at patreon.com slash Amigos podcast. Amiga, the first personal computer that gives you a creative edge. Amigos, the podcast about everything Amiga. Amigos is a proud member of the Throwback Network, your home for quality retro podcasts. And now, here are your hosts, Aaron Dowdy and John Bodokar Schaller. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Amigos. I'm John. And I'm Aaron. And today we're going to do one step beyond. Ooh, ooh. But before we get into the beyond, um, Aaron, we got some feedback Uh-oh. from... Um, one of our best friends over in Norway. Oh, beauty. Got this lovely uh, Christmas card. Isn't that nice? And it says, hi, John, Aaron, and Brent. Who's that guy? Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Best wishes, Jonas O'Brien's Retro and Vintage. Oh. And then... <laughs> How uh, timely. P.S. He's ordered a Vampire V2 Oh, plus a 500. Oh, you crazy nut. You. Is that, I wonder if he ordered it for himself or to sell. I don't know. We'll have to find out. Jonas, let us know if you uh, if, if you got that for yourself or for your shop. And then up here in the corner, he wrote Amiga Rules, spelled cool guy style. Norway, eh? Yeah. That's a beauty. And yeah. a, is, let me see what you got here. I wonder if that's a... What are those, you think? You are, you are a bird dogs? expert. I would say those are robins. Are since they? they've got a red breast. Rockin' robins? That's nice. Look at the look at the stamps. Even that's yeah, cool. Yeah, it's cool. It's, it's like a, a Viking. Viking ship, right? I love it, man. I wonder what the it. temperature up in Norway is right now. If it's this cold here, that's a good question. I guarantee you, they're not out there in uh, in Bermuda shorts. No, no. Thank you very much, um, sir. And also thank you, uh, Jonas, for your gift and inspiration for this show. One step beyond, uh, you sent us this. Uh, boxed copy. So um, we told you we'd get to it eventually, and we're we're, we're here. <laughs> but before we get into that, Aaron, has it been a busy week for the old? News. It there's been some news. Uh, let's uh, let's go for it here real quick. Uh, and I'll tell you something. Uh, a lot of this was put up by other people, and I'll mention them when they put it up. So our good and dear friend Adam Bradley. Came across on, on, a, on a Facebook page a new, uh, there is a Kickstarter going on to uh, case, uh, for new cases to house Amiga main boards, and there's a video he's linked to it. Um, I think we, we talked about something similar to this a while back. Uh, I we, think I think did we talk about we this talked one? about this on last week's Look show. Look at that though, that's man, that's a cool, that's a really cool uh, artist rendition there. Yeah. Again, I like the idea. It's a yeah. good idea. I don't know how that crept into this week's news. Um, Adam Bradley again. Now, this is something interesting. Um, and this uh, caused some trouble this week, I guess. Hyperion Entertainment confirms exclusive rights to Amiga OS. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, as we move forward here, I believe that um, Cloanto is suing them, <laughs> as I recall. Mm. Um, I don't have a link to a story on it, but I read it, and it was a pretty big deal. Um, there's going to be a throwdown tonight. Uh, I guess Hyperion and Cloanto have been at odds for a while, and uh, uh, they're going to they're going to litigate this sucker. Yeah. So I'm looking at AmigaNews.de. Love that site. And uh, yeah, it says that um, Cloanto has sued Hyperion in the USA. Uh, reason for the lawsuit is that Hyperion appealed against the application because, in their opinion, the registration could cause confusion with their own trademarks, Amiga OS and Amiga One. So even though Cloanto owns the copyright for the name Amiga, Hyperion says they shouldn't be able to establish that copyright because it's too close to their Amiga-related copyrights. Now, I talked to some, I talked to, uh, some people over on the Google Plus about this, and uh, I think it was over on Google Plus. It's very interesting because if you think about it, we should discuss this for a minute because this has ramifications. <coughs> Cloanto has, uh, obviously sells Amiga forever, and they sell the kick. They have the kickstarts they sell, um, and that's primarily. And I asked about this, and from what I can tell, that's pretty much what they do. They're not really making hardware. They're not making other stuff, and I don't think they're using the trademark for anything else right now. Now maybe they have future plans. Maybe they think they can cash in on it somewhere down the line. Whereas the Hyperion is obviously doing some different stuff. Um, 
I don't know what the end game on this is. Or I'm surprised that Cloanto doesn't do more with the with their trademarks. Maybe they're gearing up for something. But it seems like been, I mean, it's I asked around to see if there had they had done anything in for even decades with what with what they've gotten. And as far as I could tell, and from what people told me, they haven't. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the? Why would you fight and even litigate over this? What's the? I mean, surely they can't make that much money selling Kickstart ROMs and the Amiga Forever Package. I mean, it's obviously a great package. People love it. But, I mean, it can't be that big a, an earner for them, can it? Do you well, think? Well, uh, two reasons. One, uh, if you don't actively defend your copyright, it will be taken away from you. Uh, fair that's, enough. That's the law. And two, <clears throat> Cloanto... Um, is a huge, massive company that does lots of other stuff. Really? Besides. So that's what I asked about. What do they yeah. do? If you go to cloanto.com, they've got their hands in a lot of pies. Like what? Um, I mean, I, I believe you. I, I, what do they do? I haven't looked in a while, so we'll, we'll, look, we'll look it up real quick. Um, let's see, Cloanto. So they've got currency solutions, server clusters, uh, menu box. I guess they do a lot of web-based stuff. Okay, so my guess is are that... Are they huge, though, like you said, or are they just some schmucks? Well, they do more by huge. I don't know what is huge, but they do more than just put out Amiga Forever. They've got other projects, and so my guess is maybe the Amiga thing is not a big part of their earnings, but it's one part of a pie that they don't want to lose. But I wonder why... They, I mean, if I'm, a, if I'm Cloanto... I'm, I mean, I'm guessing this is what's happening. Because we've talked about this before. We're talking about the Amiga Mini idea. Surely there's there's some traction on something with that. Because Amiga hasn't been this hot forever, right? I mean, we can both... Well, I think everybody will agree that, like, we're riding a wave of right. popularity. Absolutely. Now is the time. But, I mean, I, they've, I haven't seen anything announced. I haven't seen anything... You know, aside from going after the trademark, they haven't really done much with it. Mm -hmm. And it makes me wonder... And here's a company that's trying to do something with on the Amiga... You know, do we really need to be? I mean, is the pie on the Amiga big enough where you need to litigate this stuff? Can you not work something out with these guys? I mean, that's the thing I don't get. And you know, well, I mean, it's okay. not like Hyperion just appeared, right? You know, what I'm saying. I mean, can't we? Can't we? I'm surprised they can't even try to work something out. So is is maybe Hi they did? You know, maybe they did try. I don't know. Is Hyperion? Let's see, Cloanto. So Cloanto is suing Hyperion. Right. Okay. Well, I guess. I don't understand how Hyperion, do they own the copyright to the name Amiga OS? I, I don't know. Because if they... It's, I'll let you say that when you were reading that, that, that Cloanto owned that name. Yeah, I guess I guess that what they were doing is that <laughs> maybe they were trying to settle, they were trying to maybe get the copyright for Amiga OS while letting Cloanto, you know, maybe they were trying to get it, maybe pay Cloanto something, but in the end they just took it. <laughs> And maybe Cloanto's coming after them without, you know, because they didn't get permission to use. I don't know how copyright law works in in terms of like in, involving a copyrighted name with something at the end. Like if I wanted to call my computer like the McDonald's computer, I'm pretty sure that like that wouldn't work. Also, you know? did you say that they were suing them in the U.S.? I don't know. I, I don't remember what I read. It's Hi I think you did. Okay. It's Hyperion. Oh yeah, it's in New York. They're they're suing it's, them in New York. I wonder why. Is Hyperion a U.S. based company? <sighs> These you are don't questions know. I don't know. I don't either. know. Um, it's strange. It's odd to me, and it's it's I'm kind of bummed out by it a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I hope they can work something out. But I will say one thing about Hyperion: if they end up not being able to legally use the term Amiga OS, you know, I think they could probably name it something else because the people that are using that know what it is, right? And then they can decide on okay, what's going to be call our, it like Boing Ball OS. They or could call like exactly. That's there a good go. one. Bo. You're welcome. I expect my residuals in the That's mail. a good... <laughs> now, you're going to sue Hyperion? <laughs> That's a good job, Bo. But anyway, it's an interesting story, uh, uh, you know, and uh, we'll have to see what happens, you know? It's one of those crazy, crazy yeah, things. we'll keep our finger on the pulse but it was, of that. It was, sort of a, it was sort of an interesting... A lot of people were talking about it uh, uh, this year. Um, let me see what else we've got here, Bo. Of course, we are. You should probably announce that we're back on YouTube. That's sort of a thing. Yep. If you are watching us now, you already know yeah. that we are back on YouTube. Uh, if you're watching this after the fact and you were looking for us on Twitch, uh, we have moved back to YouTube because YouTube has resolved the issue that started us to leave from YouTube in the first place. So, Good job, YouTube. Good job, YouTube. They didn't want to lose us. They were clearly number one priority yeah. for them. Now, here's an article that's submitted by, and it's funny because I was just listening to an, an, an old Amigos 
and I couldn't pronounce this name, but I can't pronounce it now. G H Anadil Elidia. All right. Anadilia. Uh, posted an article, uh, and it's about it's called buying a Commodore thirty years later. Did you have a look at this? Uh, I have article? not seen this yet. Uh, it's it is what it is. It's he talks about buying old stuff basically, and, and what what they picked up, and what can happen when it, you know stuff goes south on you. Uh, you know, it's funny. I use my Amiga so much now that I don't even think about how old it is. <laughs> but I mean, thankfully, the one I've got that Gary sent me, he did the caps on it, so I feel pretty good about it. You mm -hmm. know. Uh, but uh, uh, we're nearing the time where it's... It's funny, I don't even use an Amiga power supply on it, so I feel pretty good about that, too. You know, but if you've got an Amiga power supply and an old Amiga and you haven't done the caps and stuff like that, it's just a matter of time before it goes south on you at yeah. this point. You know? I mean, it's it's always a gamble. There's, yeah, you know, the computer, I mean, it's old, sure, but it's not as old as a lot of other computers that are in regular use. You know, like, for example, your Atari 800 is from 1978. That's crazy, isn't yeah. it? I know. Yeah. It's built like a tank, right. though. You know, and we'll say, I'll, having, I work on a lot of modern electronics, and the and there's something to be said for the old electronics. I mean, they're really tough, a lot mm -hmm. of them, you know. The caps are always the Achilles heel. Caps and batteries, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Batteries and caps leak and cause problems. Right. To get past those, it's pretty solid, mm -hmm. you know. And you're right, though. And I, God knows, no one has more vintage stuff sitting around than I do. I just replaced the cartridge slot on my NES with a non-sinking cartridge mm -hmm. slot. I can't remember what we. I can't remember the name of that uh, outfit that made it. But it's the same thing. You're trying. In this case, you're actually modifying the tech to make it less crappy than yeah. it was. So you know, there you go. But anyway, that's kind of neat. Kind of a neat article there on that. Um, Let's see if we've got anything else here. Uh, I think that's about all we've got outside of site updates. Now, we, now oh, no, that's not true. Uh, I want to talk about this. Um, there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a BBS up and running, and it's running on a Raspberry Pi Zero. It's called a Mystic BBS. I haven't got on here yet, but we, it, we did strike up a discussion about it. And uh, uh, it's a neat BBS. It's on the, again, it's all linked up on the Google+. Plus. Uh, and it, and it, um, I'm going to try to, I've got my modem for the Amiga, and I'm going to try to rig it up. But what I don't have is a phone line, okay? So I'm going to have to rig this up and go somewhere that has a phone line. You don't have a, you don't have a phone line no. either, do you? Most people around here don't have a phone. Uh, but I, my, uh, my aunt's got a phone line, and my mom and dad have a phone line. So I'm going to take the whole kit down there. I'm going to try to log on to this thing old school if I can. And and I will shoot a video of that, that when I get around to doing it. That will be kind of fun. But I, you know, BBS is yeah, they're great. We all, we love talking about them. And and someone suggested that uh, that we uh, make a BBS. Yeah. And, and I talked to one of our brain trust who was already who's already he's already on, on it. it. Jason yeah. Warrens is on it. Jason is a, is a wonder. Uh, one last thing I want to touch base on here. Uh, actually, two things. Uh, there's a couple of new games that got released this week, and they're they're. Uh, uh, they were written by a guy named Rafael Lima. He released them for free. Uh, uh, one's called Road Trip. And the other one, let me see what the other one is called here. It's called... Um, Quasari. Yes, Quas I was trying to pronounce mm -hmm. that. Uh, Road Trip is, they're both pretty interesting looking. I haven't tried them yet, but it was nice of them to release them. You know, they look pretty good, too, yeah. don't they? Yeah, I like that. They're both really colorful. Um, the last thing I want to touch base with is uh, the Guru Meditation Gang. We love those guys. They're, I love watching their videos. They've got a lot of energy, and they those guys are tech savvy. Yeah, we, and we're just sort of the dumb guys of the Amiga <laughs> scene. But uh, these guys had did a big, huge special on gin locks. Do you have you ever fooled? I know you have. I don't know why I'm so, asking you that. Do you, you know what a gin lock is? Well, it's funny because before I started this podcast, I had no idea what a right. gin lock was. But now that I've been involved in the Amiga scene, I know now that a gin lock is what you use to put credits on a you know on the front of a video or something like that. One thing the Amiga was uh, that was a big deal in the Amiga was the ability to do this stuff, mm -hmm. lay graphics over video. Right. I'm like you. I, back in the day, my buddy had, was like, man, you could do some gin lock action. I was like, <laughs> what the hell is that? You know, and then he would show me what it was. I'm like, well, holy crap, you can do TV shows. Mm -hmm. You know, that's mm -hmm. the way of my mentality. That's right. all you need. We're ready. Right. You know, and uh, the Amiga was right at the front of the line with the, with gin lock technology. And so the guru guys get in it. They, and they, it's a great video. I don't know if you have watched it yet, but the, 
they're great at explaining stuff, and they've got a they've got a lot of energy and stuff. Just love those guys. Love to get to one of those meetings up there sometime. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with with the boys, but uh, it's a good it's a good video. I recommend if you have any interest in the Gen Lock technology, it's something that's worth watching because they really do a good job of getting into it. Uh, I think that's all I've got. That's not site related, but you want me to go through the site stuff? Yeah, or you why don't you do, do that while I queue it up? Okay, let me. Uh, of course, you said that, and I missed it completely. Let me get back to it. The uh, uh, I know for certain there's one video I want to talk about right straight out of the gate, and that is that you just clicked on it right there. Uh, uh, was that who who put this? This is Chris, Chris. Folds did a compare an arcade to Amiga comparison of Chase HQ. Now I as, I mean this thing probably hadn't been up for ten seconds before I was I was, <laughs> I was on this thing. You 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 like Chase HQ? Right? I have played a little Chase HQ back in in the day. Uh, but I love videos that compare arcade to, to uh, I'm a real sucker. For, I like when we do it, too. It's mm. always a lot of fun. But I had not played Chase HQ. I have trouble saying that. Chase HQ on the Amiga. And so it was my first time ever seeing it on there. And, I, of course, I watched him play the arcade version. I was like, boy, this, that was a great game. And then the Amiga version just sucks. Oh, yeah. It I looks mean, bad. it looks like crap. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, Especially the, because the arcade version does look so good. Well, and the thing is, the Amiga could do a b much better job. This has got, this is what it reminds me of is, uh, it's sort of like an Outrun, uh, what was Outrun Europa almost? Mm -hmm. It's got that, the car is small. I mean, if you watch the arcade, it you could take something like the Lotus 2 engine, for example, and you could make this game. Well, it's funny because uh, there was a comment on this video from Scopey33 that says just that. He says, I wish somebody would take the Lotus 2 engine and co and, uh, and and write a, a clone of Chase HQ for yeah, it. Yeah, I've heard right that. Right there, bam. Well, look at that. Uh, maybe that's where I read it. Um, uh, and Outrun, yes, that's another one. Outrun, it was. I mean, this is just another uh, abomination from the graphic from the uh, arcade. Um, I know there are other versions of HHQ out for like, I think Spectrum got one. I think the I think, Amstrad yeah, got a, one. A, a ton of the, the British and PCs. I, I would one. wager that the Amiga isn't the best. Uh, I would I wouldn't be surprised if like I wouldn't be surprised at all if like the Amstrad was better, for mm -hmm. example. So anyway, there's that. Uh, Dreamcatcher. I just Chris Folds posted this in my Google Plus. Dreamcatcher is back uh, with a new article, and it's uh, it's a look at creatures. I haven't read no, this. No, we, we, we talked about this story last week. We looked at that one let's last look, week? Let's take a look at something that he wrote recently. This is uh, The Simpsons. He did an article on all of The Simpsons games. Now, that I did Amiga. read. And, uh, boy, you know, he really goes... It's just, it's just like the things he always does. He goes into the, the TV show, ties it in with the games... And, um, you know, I'm surprised that we haven't done... Did you ever play Bart versus the Space Music? I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I didn't think it was a very good game mm. when I played it, so I haven't played it I haven't it played it time. in a while, so... Um, Look, but I thought the Simpsons games, pretty much... I didn't like any of them, to be honest with you. I didn't... Even the arcade, the Konami, you know, sort of Teenage Ninja Turtle beat right. up game, I, I played it, and it was funny, but it was sort of stupid. I mean, it, was, it didn't make sense in terms of the way the show wa went. I didn't like it. There were, <laughs> were you expecting a beat em up to follow any sort well, of plot? Well, something else that that game was based on the very early Simpsons, and so people look different. They their voices don't sound the same. You know what I'm saying? Like, like Smithers looks different. But I, it just you know if you watch the old old Simpsons, mm -hmm, the first right. season or two, mm -hmm. they don't they change haircuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Wiggum's hair would be different and stuff. And then you're out there wailing on Krusty and stuff. Who wants to do that? Yeah. They really the best Simpsons games came along in like in like the Xbox era when you had Simpsons Hit and Run and uh, what was the other Simpsons Simpsons Wrestling? No, I didn't play that one. Simpsons Bowling's another one. Like, but I mean, the Simpsons Pinball Machine. The second one was really good. The first one has the same problems as the game. It's the old Simpsons, so it's not quite right, you know, as they are today. Simpsons had two good games that I really liked. It was Hit and Run, which was they had two. One was like a GTA ripoff, yeah. and one was a Crazy Taxi ripoff. Mm -hmm. And I liked those, but I mean they were ripoffs, but I mean they were still fun. And you got they had the Simpsons stuff that you like, wacky quips, and you know, it was fun. Now, those are the ones I liked. The old. Because you probably played these on the NES, didn't yeah, you? And yeah. Did you like them? Uh, I thought it, I, I only played Bart vs. the Space Mutants, and I just I always thought it was hard because I didn't understand how the puzzles worked. It's really more of a puzzle game than anything else with action elements. But um, I don't know. I'd be willing to revisit it. Oh, something I should mention. Uh, let me see. Today's date is what? The 5th? 
uh, in January 19th and 20th, uh, the Amiga Ireland 3.0. So uh, did, you, did you look at this? I love the picture. Yeah, here. that looks like a great event. Yeah, uh, it's January nineteenth and twentieth. Uh, if you're in Ireland, and uh, the the these the people that made this are always nice to us. They're uh, very looks like a very awesome event, and uh, this picture looks like they got a good crowd at the last one. Uh, so they've even got kids there. Oh, you got to have the kids there. Yeah, that's awesome. Look, Pleasance is over there hanging out. You know. <laughs> Mr. Pleasance gets, he is everywhere, man. Yeah. He, that guy is, the, he's the front runner. I'll, and he's always, he always seems like he's happy. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Happy. He's living the he's life. He's pleasant, <laughs> right? That's what he is. Um, I think that's pretty much it, man. Uh, you got anything else? You, oh, yeah. Do you have any, did you put up anything this week? Uh, I didn't put up anything this week on Amiga related, but I did put up a couple streams, uh, archive streams on the oh, YouTube channel. Your VR. Um, yeah. So I've got, um, they, you know what? switch back to here um i did a two spectrum streams i um, watched one of the streams yeah where i, I looked at um, match day two that's um, the one i watched <laughs> which is quite possibly the slowest soccer game that's my kind of game but I was it's the say, opposite of kick of it, it, kickstart two or whatever the game was kick off, yeah. kick off two um i did that i did um oh what else uh VR, I did the Oculus uh, demo, which is my favorite thing I've ever done in VR. That's the one where the, you're in that crazy garage. Right, yeah. right. I um, like that. That's got a lot of retro computer stuff with it. Yeah, that was uh, kind of funny. And um, there were some other things, too. It's it's funny because I usually take big blocks of stuff when I've got free time and, and sort of, you know, uh, put it out slowly. But um, I know that there is a part two of a Spectrum stream coming, and I'm making a list for a third Spectrum stream where I'm going to cover... Um, Marble Madness for the Spectrum, which oh, is a okay. really interesting game because in a lot of ways it's different than the arcade game and all of its clones. Really? So the uh, uh, it I could see where that would work on the spec. Yeah, you yeah, sort of in a way. It's 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 very interesting, um, and uh, there's there's a couple other things, but that was basically it. the big things from this past week were the Spectrum streams. What is that game you're going through on the NES? Uh, Star Tropics. How is that coming along? So I, I've not been back to Star Tropics recently, um, but uh, you had th three parts. Of that? I, I've got that... three parts, and it's going to be part three of like twenty-seven. Oh, was, it's that a very was my long question. Game. Are you been saving it as you go, or um, I really just I'm waiting for the right time to play it. Um, I it's it's sort of one of those games where I get frustrated and I have to make a lot of edits because I die all the time, yeah. and so it's a little bit of work to to put the finished project the finished product up, but. Uh, We've also put out a couple extra um, pre-shows from The Vault, uh, episode 53, uh, titled Huntington, <laughs> A God-Awful Death Hole. <laughs> oh, no. What a horrible title. Um, I've also got what I actually played on the Spectrum stream here. I played uh, Shadow of the Beast on the Spectrum. That is not good. But really? Again, is it's it as not hard very, as the Amiga one? It's not as hard as the Amiga one. Um, and it's it's... It's just really <laughs> weird. Um, also played Lotus on the Spectrum, oh. which was actually really good. Really? Okay. And uh, Manic Miner, Lord of the Rings, uh, also, which is uh, you know a mod of, of Manic Miner where you're in Bilbo's house and stuff like right. that. Um, and so, yeah, that's just a lot of retro gaming fun going on. This that's week. pretty cool. That's yeah. pretty cool, man. All right, Aaron. You ready to move on? Yeah. Well, I'm not. Oh, I'm sorry. We have one more piece of feedback okay. this week. Oh, you're saving one? I was here? saving one. I All right, definitely didn't forget about it. Okay. Um, new Patreon supporter All right. wrote in, say, I really, I've really enjoyed watching Amigos for a long time. He's been an Amiga user since the 90s. He says, I believe what you guys are doing is great. And uh, please use my handle name, Level Lord. Ooh, Level yeah. Lord. I like it. So it's uh, old school, man. I'm going to start, because I haven't updated the list, I'm going to start the list with Level Lord. Oh, he gets, he gets, the, he gets to be at the very front. He's going to be at the I very front. I guess that's good. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if you pay a ton more in Patreon, he just doesn't sing your name. <laughs> I leave it off on purpose. <laughs> so you ready to go into... Let's go for it. Amigo's Game of the Week. One Step Beyond. Uh, no. <laughs> you I did that the last time I did this segment. You just you just bigfooted right over. Are it. we? I thought we were going to do the game and then do the year. No, the no, no. The game is the main event. You see. Okay. The game is the main event. So it's your show. Oh, <laughs> finally <laughs> recognition. <laughs> so uh, we thought we would do a, a part two of our year by year Amiga segment this week, and take a look at what was going on in the Amiga and in the world of gaming in 1986. Uh, if you want to hear part one and you missed that it was in the uh, 
episode with Top Banana. I recommend the second you finish the the eight nineteen eighty five, you shut it off and never and never play Top Banana in any circumstances. So what we're doing here is just sort of going over what was out, what was available for the Amiga in eighty six. Uh, what was going on in the rest of computers and gaming in 86, and what was going on with the other competing games uh, and computers in, in the same year, So, and, and what kind of releases they were getting. So uh, you'll recall in, 80, in 85, of course, the Amiga got released late, if you'll recall. It was like around November. So there was not very much to uh, talk about in 85. 86, there was a lot more stuff going on. So first things first, the... Uh, uh, so, the between September of '84 and March of '86, Commodore lost three hundred million dollars. So that's <laughs> it's not a good, it's not a good start. No, uh, <coughs> but they did have some stuff happen in '86 that was that's pretty impressive. Uh, January first of the year, Commodore released a game called Mind Walker. Now we've actually touched on Mind Walker just very slightly back. But it's a game that the one thing about it that's interesting is it it's ever since it was released January first of nineteen eighty six, it will run on every version of Kickstart and every machine released after that date. Hmm. Kind of neat. I don't know who knows. It's just something that people do. Released in February of nineteen eighty six, Kickstart one point one PAL is completed, and uh, uh, so PAL is now a fully featured standard that's capable of going being sold around the world. Okay, which who knew that would be such a big deal later down the road, right? Uh, Kickstart 1 2 was finished in September of 86. So 1 1 wasn't around too long before 1 2 came out. And then there were versions of. And, and I just want to interrupt you for a second. Yeah. You've got to remember that this is not the same thing as your phone when, you know, when Android or Apple releases, uh, <laughs> you know, a software update, you just boop and you get it. Right. And if I, you're stuck with 1.1 uh, in your Amiga and there's a bug well, in 1.1. One, one thing you're forgetting, uh, on the Amiga 1000, Kickstart was disc-based. So they could actually send you discs at least. It's easier than upgrading right, the ROM. Right, but still it's yeah. different than, yeah. I'm guessing that since, and, and uh, hilariously, one, in October they released 1.2, in November they released 1.2.1. Wow. Okay, so why did they do that? Well, chances are, since they were just ramping up production, they were probably trying to up to uh, tweak as many of these things as they could so they could get the newest, bestest running ROM in a machine before they shipped out a ton of them, maybe yeah. my guess. Uh, but one would wonder what 1.1 had that 1.1, 1 1.2 .1, improved on, mm -hmm. so that God only knows. Um, so, uh, like I said, Commodore lost a lot of money in 85, and uh, the fellow that was running was, uh, Commodore was named uh, Marshall Smith. He was replaced by a fellow named Thomas Radigan, who was a Pepsi executive. Boy, these Pepsi executives, they, you know, John Scully, you know, his significance? Uh huh. So he, he was a, also a Pepsi executive that left Pepsi to go to work for Apple, and he's the one that oh. fired Steve Jobs. Oh, wow. Well, there you go. That, not a good track record, no. although, eh. Um, this guy, so they, this happened in 86 February. Okay. Okay, so uh, the first thing this guy did, Radigan, when he got in, was he stopped production on all the old stuff. Your, Good move. Believe it or not, they were still producing Connor Pets and Vic 20s in 86, apparently, when this guy took over. And so he got rid of some of those. He also apparently got rid of some prototype stuff and he fired a bunch of people. <laughs> it's the classic Pepsi maneuver. That's right. And so, I'll, but I will say, uh, the last quarter of 86, Connor made a profit of $22 million and paid off all its debts. So it paid off. So, uh, 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 not bad, no. you know. So the uh, one, the funny thing about the Amiga is that year you started seeing a lot of, of uh, hardware came out come out that would end up being a setting the stage for future things that would sell the system, right? Mm -hmm. um, I thought this was neat. One, it, this is eighty six, so the thing's been out for less than a year, or you know, for the most part of that year. Right. You've got the A uh, the A ten sixty, which is that IBM XT emulation bridge board. All right, that's pretty. I mean, that was sort of unusual. You, you wouldn't. Know, you, what what could you do with that XT stuff? I mean, I had a bridge board in my one thousand, 
and it lets you run DOS, and you could run, I mean, you weren't going to be playing like the latest games, but you could run DOS stuff in it with no problem. Okay. And it was impressive, you know, and, and even software could emulate the PC to a certain degree that was okay. Um, <clears throat> so I thought that was kind of neat. Uh, a little company called New Tech, you might have heard of them, they did the video toaster. They released a, a parallel port frame grabber that year called the DigiView. I had a DigiView. It's a, uh, in fact, I believe Gary did a, a, a thing with a DigiView a couple months ago. But it was a, uh, it, you basically it was a, you hook up to a video camera up to it. And you could take, you could take uh, grabs of the screen mm -hmm. on it and, you right. could, and make pictures. Right. And it had a color wheel and it was real, a real pain in the butt. There were a couple s uh, companies that put out. These parallel port sound digitizers, including Perfect Sound, which I also had. Uh, you hook it in your parallel port, it's got an input, and it will digitize sound. You know, who, before that, who could have done that? I never, never even heard about that. Well, the Tandy had this thing that you could talk into, and it, or you could play, but it was hor It was god-awful. I mean, it was remedial at best. This was something that you could do something with. So uh, that was something that came out, you know, Perfect Sound, which was a pretty big deal. Uh, a lot of people released RAM expansions. They started releasing stuff to go in the uh, uh, in the 1000 on the RAM, on the slot and, and on the front slots. There was a lot of RAM expansions. So uh, uh, that year, you got to see some hardware taking shape. And the uh, the importance of the of the Perfect Sound and the and the Digi you can't be over uh, overestimated because these guys these things set the stage for future video and sound things that could happen on the Amiga up to that point. You know, again, it just came out in November, so they're, you're starting to see the potential of the Amiga, you know, come come forward. So, um, it's 86. What else is going on in that year? There's some interesting stuff that happened. I turned uh, five. Oh, man. I graduated in 89, so I, was a, I guess I was a sophomore. <laughs> so, uh, at the Golden Joystick Awards that year, the Gauntlet, Gauntlet took the gold. That says, I can believe it. It's a great game. <laughs> yeah. Um... Stuff that came out that year, uh, Nintendo released The Legend of Zelda, all right? SNK released Akari Warriors. Uh, Enix released Dragon Quest, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Nintendo released Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels, which they didn't release in North America. That's the one that they thought was too hard for the right. States. Um, Ar Arkanoid came out, which I thought was kind of cool, and also Metroid. So there was a lot of stuff going on 86 the 86 was a bumper year. Oh, yeah, there was a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I, I'm just going to go over a few of these. Adventure Island, uh, Outrun came out, uh, which is the, uh, the very first Castlevania came out. Uh, Kid Icarus, which is a game my brother and me played the you know, heck out of. Um, Activision released uh, a bunch of stuff. But they released Labyrinth, the computer game developed by LucasArts. Uh, Might and Magic Book 1 came out for the Apple II. That was the first Might and Magic game, which I didn't want, went on to be a you know, huge series. The Atari released the 1040 ST, the second ST in the line. Mm -hmm. right? So they're already out with the second one. It had a meg of RAM, and it was priced in U.S. dollars at 1000 so, uh, they And what, what was the Amiga selling for at that time? We, we mentioned it in the last episode, but it was like, I believe it was like 1600 bucks or 1400 bucks, not counting the monitor, something like that. It was, it was more. They said... Uh, uh, the Atari 1040 ST, according to Wiki here, was the first computer that had a cost per kilobyte of under a dollar. Interesting. Now, here's some other hilarious stuff. Atari released the 7800 console, all right? That was two years later than they were going to release it, so uh, it was doomed. Yeah. All right, let's face yep. facts. But w since we're Atari, let's be idiots. Would they release the Atari 2600 Junior for under 50 bucks? <laughs> So and they undercut themselves. They undercut yep. themselves, and with the 7800's big, biggest selling point being the fact that it could play Atari it backwards cartridges. compatible. Uh, just, so you, just so you know, you're right. The Amiga with the monitor, the 1000, was selling for uh, about 1600 bucks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the S Sega released the Master System in the U.S., right? A big deal, right? Uh, Texas Instruments released at the TMS 34010. And who can forget that? Well, no, but eventually they would use this stuff, right? Um so, the oh, and Activision merged with Infocom. That's sort of a big deal. Mm -hmm. And Sinclair acquired Amstrad. So, that all happened in 86. So, there was a lot going on. And if you think about what was going on with the NES in particular and the Master System coming out, yeah, that really muddies the waters even more than when we looked at 85. 
because, and you mentioned this uh, in the episode we did about 85, but now you're, if you're, the Amiga didn't start out being a, they didn't want to pitch this as a game machine. From our perspective, it sort of always was, right? But now if you're playing games on the Amiga, you're paying uh, 1400 bucks, and you're, and the games you play have to compete with stuff like Castlevania and uh, Metroid, Metroid and Zelda, and, Zelda mm -hmm. and all the Master System library, which there was some good stuff on the Master System. Plus, you've still got to pick you know, all the Atari stuff still out there. Now the ST has a cheaper version that's mm -hmm. out. There's a lot of competition out there, and the TI is still hanging out. In the I didn't realize until just now how much more expensive the Amiga was than the ST. That's mind-boggling that it was six hundred dollars more expensive, over fifty percent more expensive. It was a, it was a, it was pricey, you know. I mean, that's <clears throat> crazy. I can't believe that Amiga sold anything in the states. So let's look. Let's get to the nitty gritty. You'll recall that when we looked at the software that was released in '85, it was sort of an anemic batch of software. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, the Archons, I'd say, were the, the Archon was probably the big game that I, that I remember. And a lot of Infocom stuff, and a lot of uh, there was that weird sex simulate or sex education program, and is, remember that, uh, and there's some other stuff. So there was not a whole lot of happening. So let's look at just a, just a quick correction from the chat. Um, Amstrad acquired Sinclair. Not oh, the other what did way I around. say? You said yeah, Sinclair. I'm sorry, guys. I'm an idiot. So you've got. I looked at there were 75 games according to, and I, I did the same thing I did last time. I went to a couple of different sites, uh, Hall of Light and Lemon to see, uh, try to call, call together a list of games that were released in 86 only. Now again, there's some of these games that were bled over and some and on some of the games they didn't agree, all right? So you may see some that are released very late or very early in the cycle, right? You understand what I'm saying? So according to those, according to those uh, guys, in 86, there were 75 games released on the Amiga commercially. So that's twice as many, right, as in 85? Weren't there only about 30 games there in like, 85? Like, I can't remember, it was like 30 or 40 games, mm -hmm. right? So you're more. Okay, now, but get this. Out of 75 games, 20 of those titles were text adventures. <clears throat> oh, my gosh. All right, 20 of them. So, and I'm, I'm not going to read all these, but, I mean, the, high, the heavy hitters on these are, you know, uh, they're all Infocom, pretty much. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Enchanter, uh, Deadline, Leather Goddess of Phobos, which I played the heck out of that. Uh, you know, Suspect, a lot, a lot of those. The Zork Trilogy was released in 86. So you've got a lot of text games, a lot of them. 20. So I remember last time, in fact, I just listened to the episode today, and you were like, people were still playing text games in 85? Well, they were still playing them in 86, too, if you had an Amiga. Well, I don't know if people were playing them, but they sure were putting them out. <laughs> right. So... So that was, like I said, there were, seven, there, were, there, were 70, there were 75 games, 20 were text games. 16 of the games were educational titles, okay? Um, the heavy hitters here, I mean, Donald Duck Playgrounds, there was a Disney one that was Sierra put out. Um, some key, you know, stuff, that, Math Wizard, Math Talk, you know, what you would suspect. Stuff to teach you how to use the keyboard, that sort of thing, all right? There were, there were uh, four simulation titles, okay? And feel free to chime on any of these that you've played, all right? I'm assuming you hadn't played many of the text adventures or the educational titles. So you had Arctic Fox, which nope. was a tank game, mm -mm. right? Silent Service, which I've played that one. That was a submarine game, okay? Super Huey, which I've also played, which is sort of a, a helicopter simulator. And The Surgeon, now, I haven't played that, but I want to put that on the list. That I think I good. have played Super Huey. I've definitely played a game with the name Huey in the title. Yeah, yeah. It's either Super Baby, right? Right. So that was four simulation titles. There were six sports titles, all right? So you've got Arena, which are some Psygnosis, which I have not played this, and I don't know what exactly it is. It's a multi-event game, so it could be some sort of, I don't know. Might be something fun. I like those multi-event games. Championship Golf, all right, from Activision. GBA Championship Basketball. GBA? You got me. I don't know what that hmm. stands for. It's from Activision as well. Gridiron from Bethesda. Leaderboard Access, right. which we took a look at. And Mean 18, which I have played Mean so 18. So a, a lot of golf games. Mean 18 from Accla. Yeah, one, two, three. Three games were of the six. Right? <laughs> so I, I, Boy, I, when your library is 50% golf games. That's <laughs> I, thankfully, I could break these down quite easily thanks to... Uh, the fine folks at Lemon, they, they made it a lot, made it easy for me. So, strategy games, three of them, okay? 
One's a sequel, Hacker 2. Okay. Remember we talked about Hacker yep. 1. <clears throat> Ogre, which I've heard of but haven't played. And Defender of the Crown. Now remember, Defender of the Crown was right there on the borderline. So clearly, it's just of looking at the titles we've looked at, you can see why Defender of the Crown stood out. Right. If that was because it was that looks like something you'd pay twelve hundred bucks, fourteen hundred bucks for. Right. Absolutely. Even, right. <coughs> Shoot 'em ups. You had five titles. Okay. Which is funny because the Amiga was going to have tons of great shoot 'em ups. Mm -hmm. And of these titles, I've only heard of one. Okay. You've got Deep Space from Psygnosis. I've not played that. Fire Blaster, uh, I got a game called Sky Fox from Electronic Arts, that one I've played. Space Battle from Diamond Software, and War Zone from Paradox. I've only played one of those. These are some of the most generic sounding well, titles also. You yeah. know. I mean, you can't move product with a name like War Zone. Right, and now we're getting into sort of the dregs here. <laughs> so you have one gambling title, Video Vegas. You've got a one card title, and of course, much like last time, you got to have one of these from the people. I believe these. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where these guys came from, but hey, strip poker, a sizzling game of chance. Sounds good, right? Yeah. Um, that's your card game. If you want to play wow. cards, <laughs> brain games, as they're categorized. One title, Shanghai. Now I had Shanghai on the Coco. It's a like a tile game. It's Mahjong. Yeah. yeah. There was one board game release, and it was chess. The Chess chess Master 2000, very popular yeah, chess game, true. if you'll recall. Mm -hmm. Okay, arcade games. There were two, and we actually covered one, and we mentioned the other one. One, Mind Walker, which we just talked about. The other one, Marble Madness. So we actually played one of the better games of 86, and we didn't even know it. That was, what, the second or third episode? Well, I we remember we, we definitely talked about how it was a really early title when we, uh, when we <laughs> reviewed it. These are the last eight titles here. They're uh, adventure titles, okay? Now, I will say there's a couple good ones in here. You've got Adventure Construction Set from EA. Classic, mm -hmm. right? Bard's Tale. Classic from EA as well. The Fairy Tale Adventure. Now, I've heard good things about Fairy Tale Adventure. I've never played it. Golden Path from Firebird. I'm not familiar with that mm -hmm. one. Portal, believe it or not, was a, a game uh, that was released in 86 from Activision. This is another one. Temple of Apshai Trilogy. I have played the Apshai games back in the day, and I don't know if you ever, you ever played them. They were fun. They're very basic. Ultima 3 Exodus, which I also played the Ultima games back in the day on the Atari. Mm -hmm. Ultima, always good. I mean, yeah. but I mean, in depth, you yeah. know how it is. And another great one, Deja Vu and Nightmare Comes True. This game was really awesome. Uh, uh, the interface was really good on it, and it, on the Amiga was great. I believe it got ported over to the NES, I think, too, mm -hmm. Deja Vu. Uh, so... Those are your those are your game your basically your games that came out that year. Now, to put it in perspective, um, I had a look at what was released for other machines. I'm not gonna, I, and I even listed out some of the ones for the C64 because I thought it might be kind of fun. So, as we said, there were 75 games released on the Amiga. Okay, uh, find my totals here. So here are the top 20 games released on the C64 the same year. Okay. Uh, and these were called together uh, from some four members on the Lemon Forums, okay? So I'll just go from 20 to 1. Druid, all right, which, you know, man. Parallax, Cauldron 2, Euridium, which is good. He a Green Beret, which is an arcade port, if you, I don't know if you ever played it. Heavy Metal Paradroid, The Great Escape, Super Cycle, Thrust, Thrust. Dan Dare, The Sentinel. Then you get into some here I've heard of. Ghosts and Goblins, Boulder Dash Construction Kit. You ever play Boulder Dash? No. Boulder Dash is awesome. Infiltrator, Gunship, which is another cool game. World Games, which we've talked about playing that. World Games is like summer games, winter mm -hmm. games. I think I have played Boulder Dash. That was an Apple II game, I think. Yes, it was. Yeah. International Karate, right? Leaderboard, Golf, Alter Ego, which is a perennial game. All you ever played Mess with Alter Ego? Yeah, now you have to look at it. And Ultima Four, so they were the already Runes of Virtue. Ultima Four, so they were already uh, Ultima up on us yeah. at that at that point. Um, so let me skip back here to my uh, totals. So the, as I said, the uh, we we got we got uh, seventy five games released here. Let me flip through here. Try to find where I've stuck them. None of those, what games of that list stuck out to you from, from the Amiga list? Did anything stick out to you in terms of something that you would have heard of or you think is a quality title? No. 
I'm going to be really honest with you. Wow. Uh, it, it, it seems like a lot. I mean, these might be awesome games, but they were games that I'm totally not aware of, except for the games that we've played on the show. Um, so there you go. I, don't, I don't know what that means. So um, <coughs> in 86, again, these are figures called together from various uh, list sites and mm -hmm. people that have the indexes. There were 410 C64 games released. There were... 256 Atari 8-bit games wow. released. Now, consider if the in 85, I think there was like over 600 games released for the 8-bits. Oh, sure. I mean, you can, they're definitely slowing down, but right. still, they've still got momentum. And then the Atari ST, 67 games. So you can see clearly that there's that the ST is sort of taking some of the 8-bit Atari's thunder, but not really. 200 and some <laughs> games yeah, not really. uh, is, is still pretty good. So, in terms of uh, application software that came out that year, uh, Page Setter on the Amiga, uh, the uh, MaxiSoft released uh, Maxi Desk and Maxi Plan, right? Um, the Aegis Animator, I think I'm saying that right. I remember I actually had that. Uh, the uh, Deluxe Music Construction Set, which was I remember hearing about that again. This is stuff that I didn't use. Um, the music instruction set I got, I have on the Atari. Oh yeah, well yeah. there you go. Um, so there was there were some pretty decent things released that year. Um, that's pretty much the long and short of it. Um, you can tell that Atari. It's funny how Atari blew their edge if you think about it. They were getting more titles released. They had a cheaper machine, and it was more than capable. Are you talking? Do you mean to say Atari? Here? Atari ST. Okay. They they should have ha they should have done better than they ended up doing. Is my point. Mm -hmm. They had a they had a big lead, really. If you look at it. Well, they they had a big lead, and they kept a big lead for the entire length of the machine. The mm -hmm. Atari outsold the Amiga. The Atari ST. That's yeah, what I'm about. the ST outsold the Amiga. In, I don't think in so. In both Bo. America and in the U and in Europe. Look it up. I'll have to look into that. I, yeah, I, it was the dominant I player. I don't think so. I think you're incorrect on that one. Okay. Brother. I think chat. We'll we'll let you uh, we'll let you decide. I think. Oh, th I, I don't know. I, yeah, Laurent is responding. Actually, it did not, but I don't know who Thank he's you, responding Laurent. to. I knew I was right. So next, we're going to be getting into '87, where I think we're going to see the games pick up a little bit and uh, see a system that starts to come into its own. So I'm looking forward to that one. Well, I really like this segment because it just goes to show, like, there's a whole universe of games that I've never heard of. He's making the right call. You ready to move on to... Amigo's Game of the Week. Beyond. One Step one Beyond. One Step Beyond. As I Madness. bring this out again, you want me to put it back again? No, before you... When you think of One Step Beyond, what's the... Without looking at the game box, what's the first thing that pops in your head? Now, I know that it's... I guess it's a song by Madness. That's right. The only song that I know by Madness is... What's that's their song? Well, there's two things that pop into my mind: the song, and also they're like standing crazy on the covers. Did of the you ever LPs? watch the show One Step Beyond? It was a uh, was that like McGee and sixties anthology show in the vein of it was an hour long anthology show. It's sort of like a C grade Twilight Zone. No. Okay. But I figured that you are an expert. That sounds like something. Well, right I mean, I've got alley. a lot of them on tape. I've seen a lot of them, but they're not. They're sort of. I'll, I liked them more when I watched them than I do now. Mm. You know, so. But, but this game go. is not related to the uh, anthology series. No, no, it's not. It's related to marketing, <laughs> and fully and completely. So let's get into this okay. thing. So, one step beyond the full title featuring Colin Curley. Now we're going to be at a bit of a loss on this due to the fact that I, I don't think we've ever tried the snack. And we well, have, we have we had have quavers. These? Chris Fold sent us quavers. I thought, I, at, I, at I thought we had had some of those. Yeah. I was thinking, I couldn't remember for sure. So um, they taste kind of like uh, it's a very light, um, like uh, cheesy taste. Well, there you go. Almost like a cheese puff. He did send stuff Amiga related, and that makes sense. Now, yeah, doesn't it? yeah. So let's get it. So this was the, uh, sent out in '93. Two discs. Right. It was developed by an outfit called Red Rat. <laughs> One of the worst names I've ever heard for a developer. Uh, Red Rat, didn't. they did some stuff on the Amiga, but they did a lot of work on the Atari ST. Um, the Amiga stuff they released included International Soccer Challenge, the Lombard RAC Rally, Pushover, 
which is the prequel That's to That's the this, one we should have reviewed, right? apparently. Wild Wheels and Screaming Wings, all right? Um, so before we get anything else, I looked into Red Rat. I tried like gangbusters to find something. I found an interview. I had to use the Wayback Machine just to get to this wow. thing. It was it was uh, it's been deleted. Been buried from, in the. I had to get into it, right? So it's an interview with a fellow named Tony Gocher. Okay, he okay. he was a guy that worked at Red Rat, and he was he worked on the Atari side. So, but I thought there were a couple interesting questions and answers. So the question was, what was the situation at Red Rat? Can you tell some interesting stories about the time? He said Red Rat was run by three guys: Chas Partington, Harry Nadler, and Don Rigby. They ran the business from a basement in Fennel Street in Manchester. Wow. Hey, shout out to uh, yeah. shout uh, out to Dreamcatcher. Manchester. It, it, it was slightly unusual in that the premises consisted of a shop specializing in Atari software and hardware, and in the back was a printing shop where they produced all the inlays for the games in addition to printing menus. You know, that's not a bad idea. And wedding invitations. <laughs> put, put, you, you know, have a print shop slash game development studio <laughs> all in one. I love it. Everything in-house. So uh, he said, they asked him um, what was the most popular game that they sold and how well did their game sell? He never knew what games sold the most, but he said or what, how things sold. He didn't see the accounts. But he said their biggest game was Screaming Wings. Okay. All right, so Screaming Wings. Um, I think that's pretty much about all I've got on that particular. I mean, they just there's nothing out there. I had to really scrape to find Boy, that. Red Rat. If you if you know if if you work for Red Rat back in the day, if you know someone that was involved with Red Rat, let us know. So, I need to know more. So let's talk about just while we're on the subject of Red Rat. Let's talk about the prequel, the first game in this series. If Pushover. You will. Pushover. Mm -hmm. So Pushover was a platform uh, game. It's a puzzle game. And it was it came out in 92 on the Amiga, the ST, and DOS, and the Super Nintendo. Wow. All right, yeah. It was smart. It was sponsored by Quavers as well. And now it was, uh, but this place was owned by, uh, they, I guess Quavers uh, changed owners. And they were now owned by an outfit called Walkers. And in this one, uh, the Quaver's mascot, Colin Curley, is in this one too. He lost his packet of Quavers down an ant hill, and you control an ant that's going down to qu recover the Quavers. You know, I've done an Amigos plays on this game before. <laughs> on this one, you have. Yeah, right? I totally forgot. I, I thought this looked like it was yeah. right up your alley because yeah. it's got a, it's got a Domino Man thing right. going on. This looked pretty clever to me, it is. actually. This is a much better game than the one we're about to review. Now, get this: the NES, the Super Nintendo version of this doesn't have the Quavers branding. And in this, in the in Super Nintendo version, you're recovering bundles of cash dropped down the anthill by Captain Rat. <laughs> Captain Rat. It's the Red Rat connection. Something tells me that the people at Red Rat, they needed, really needed a, a writer at Red Rat <laughs> to help these guys out. So now, speaking of writers, I can't start this, this uh, look at this without reading from the manual, because this is a must here. Now this is the pushover manual? This, or is, no, this, okay. is the, this is the manual for so, the game we're looking so we're at, one on step beyond, and yeah, we're moving okay. on. So, um, in case you didn't know it, uh, this game was sponsored again by Quiver, Quavers. Quavers. Help me out here, Quavers. Quavers. And did you know what we call an eighth note in America? In England, they also call a Quaver. No kidding, no, yeah. I did not know that. Good. Interesting fact. So you've got the manual here. I've got the manual here. So do you want to read, the, just read the, you really need to read the flavor text because, uh, and the read, the, you'll understand why after okay. you read it. Okay. So this is both reading from the <clears throat> manual. Go ahead. Rain battered the windows as Colin Curley settled down to play his favorite computer game, Pushover, which Quinson only happened to involve his favorite snack, Quavers. Other than eating quavers, there was nothing Colin would rather do, especially on such a dark and stormy night. As the puzzles in the game grew harder and Colin's quaver supply grew smaller, he became more and more absorbed in the game, failing to notice the storm raging harder and harder outside. All he could think was, this game plays curly. At last, Colin reached the final level, number 100 was also down to his last packet of quavers. As fate would have it, two amazing things happened simultaneously. Colin popped the last quaver in his mouth. Amazing. Just as he finished the game, most amazing. The explosive one in a million combination of quavers and awesome gameplay resulted in Colin being digitized and curlified into his computer. He had never felt anything so exciting since he first tasted quavers. <laughs> That's a 
No. How many times was the word quaver used in that first, in that opening paragraph? Enough to satisfy Quaver Marketing Limited. Let me tell you something. This has got quavers up the yazoo here. Now, and you can tell by that deep philosophical writing piece there that these guys really put a lot of work into the into the uh, plot behind More it. so than the final boss of Pushover. Clearly, they had seen Tron. And this is very similar, except for, thank God, Tron was eating Man, wouldn't it be great if, 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 if there was a Tron Quavers? No. Uh, no. That would not okay. be great. That would be god-awful, boat. <laughs> so, um... This game, again, we mentioned it came out in 93. It was a sequel. So you're thinking, okay, puzzle game. And it is. It's, it's, and if you watched Pushover, and I watched a video on Pushover, it looked like some pretty interesting puzzle yeah. action. Yeah. So where, where in that one, you use sort of dominoes to complete puzzles. And this one, you sort of step on platforms. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I remember when we first looked at this, we had mentioned that it was it had a Kubert feel to it. It doesn't feel like Kubert at no, all. No, no. That was incorrect. Yeah. Uh, I will say the first thing that happened to me when I booted this up on the Amiga, I put the AD, I put the uh, I mounted this on the uh, virtual floppy, fired mm -hmm. it up, and it came up to a screen with with Colin Curley and Quavers prominently displayed, <laughs> mm -hmm. and just some boxes. I was like, "What the hell am I doing here?" I could not even figure out what to do. That's the if you're watching mm -hmm. the video, it just popped up. And so I had to find a trainer version. Really? To just to give me to play it. And something else I noticed is that when I watched the video for this to see if I'd missed anything, it had an intro that mine did not have. Did you see the intro to yeah, this? Yeah, mine fired right Do up. Do you want to explain what happens in the intro? So yeah, in the intro in this game, um, it's basically what I just read. Exactly. Yeah. I don't need to explain it because you just heard yeah, the story. It, it, that's basically it's just, it, the whole thing, the lightning or whatever. Mm -hmm. He gets zapped. He gets pulled into the TV. And the thing about Colin Curley is, as he as this stuff's happened to him, he has the stupidest, dumbest, <laughs> happiest look on his face. <laughs> he loves being digitized. As a character, zapped. this guy is a, 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 a. What is he? Is he a? He's a, a dog. But I mean, he just looks like an insane person. Well, that, I can't. I can't argue with that. <laughs> he reminds me of like. <laughs> I don't remember Butch from the old Droopy cartoons. If he went to an insane asylum, basically, <laughs> that would be what he would look like. Uh, Quavers is mentioned is is right there in the opening, mm -hmm. over and over. It's everywhere. Every Quavers, Quavers. So I mean, there's no doubt who's sponsoring this game. I don't know what kind of deal they made, but I guess the first one didn't well enough to where they sponsored another one. Yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> Quavers are they're the equivalent of you know how Halo has the Mountain Dew tie-in and everything like that. I mean, Quavers were the thing in the '80s. I guess you want to get your kids hooked on these uh, addictive. Tasty treats. I wonder how big a deal these are in the UK. Quavers? Oh, yeah. they're huge. Are they? Are they like yeah. Fritos they're like or Doritos they're like or cheetah, something? Like oh, Cheetos. I see. Yeah. So they're a pretty big deal. Yeah, this That's is the, the screen I'm th talking about right there. This is the Chester Cheetah of England. <laughs> this guy's lame. <laughs> and by the way, this guy also got replaced, but I'll get to that later. So getting back to the game, you start in a door, and your goal is to... There, these little panels are... In the first level, we'll just explain because it's pretty simple. You, you start in this little area, and you're on a little, like, like let's say, diving board off of a box. How about that? And your goal is to jump, and and every time you jump on one of these diving boards, it goes away. And your goal is to jump on them all and then jump into the Quaver's box mm -hmm. at the end. Right. And and then your guy jumps into the, what presumably is a bag of Quavers and eats them, and it goes to the next level. Yeah. Right? That's it. That's it. That's now, the game. Now, now, as you progress through the game, uh, you get tokens. And, you, and the tokens are used to, I think they, are these used to keep you going? I cheated okay. and had unlimited tokens. Here's so the weird thing the about this game. Thing. Yeah. There are no lives in this game. You right. can just keep playing forever and ever and ever. So all the token means is that you just get to go on to the next you set of skip, levels. You skip, right? You can skip over one you can't do. No, that, that, it's not even that. It's just uh, your next quaver token just means you get, you're privy to the next set of levels. Oh, I That's see. That's all it means. I see. And that number on the opening screen, is that just a, is that a way to... That's, a, that's that a, a password. Okay, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Again, mine was... I used the cracked version because I couldn't get anything else to work. So the first couple levels are pretty simple, right? Mm -hmm. you, and, and there's and your guy has movement. Something else that makes this game strange to me is, is the movement of your guy. It was hard to pin down exactly how far you could jump. Mm -hmm. And then what... Did you have this trouble? I mean, I got used to it after a while, but at I first... I never got used to this. My I could not play this game well because I could not figure out... In the manual, it says if you want to make him do a long jump, 
you it's just the button, but if you want to make it a short jump, you have to hold down fire. Why? Well, I swear to you, I was holding down fire and pushing over, and he was still doing that long jump. Well, I, I this game, I'd say again, I played this on the the Huckster six hundred. Maybe yeah, playing it on a real and machine I, might have and been your advantage. And I used the the CD thirty two gamepad. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm falling in love with this gamepad. That's this good. This game is this gamepad is underrated. It looks stupid. It does look stupid. It feels kind of clunky, but I mean, it's actually and mine has a rattle to it. I don't mm -hmm. know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually is a really massively designed controller. It really is. And I use it, and it took me a while to get the controls of this down. But eventually I got them down to where I could... I mean, the thing is, occasionally I would screw up and it would piss me off mm -hmm. because the controls are go they're a little goofy. <clears throat> uh, like like he said, if you want to, there's a long jump and a short jump. It was sort of like Flashback or something, right? Right, you know? right. very much or like Prince Flashback. Or Princess Persia. Mm -hmm. You had to, like, there are certain things... So as you jump from diving board to diving board, they, most of them will, once you hit them, they'll go away. Mm -hmm. right? Sometimes there are markings on the little block that the diving board has, and they, the different markings will cause the box to, to do different things. Sometimes uh, if there's an arrow pointing in a direction, it'll, it'll pop you into that direction. So you'll fly up in the air diagonally, let's say, or straight up, or depending on what, you know, what little shape is on there. <clears throat> Sometimes... You'll hop on one, and it will, it will activate all the, all the diving boards in certain directions. Either come on or go off. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll tell you, uh, and I'm not ashamed to admit this. This got too hard for me too quick. I got to a point where I just couldn't get past it and didn't feel obligated to give a crap. I, I mean, in terms of uh, this there was, game, there's, there's no story. There's no incentive. To keep you going, it's like I wonder what's going to happen after this level. What's well, it's going to be more levels? This game shows its hand to you immediately. The game is the very first screen you see with the when you play the puzzle. That's the game. Mm -hmm. Now there are going to be more blocks. There are going to be different. I mean, it's a game. You know what it reminds me of? Boat. You remember when the internet was first getting cooking? Nabisco and some of these other companies would put out these uh, flash games. And they would have a tie-in to say, like, like I remember Life Savers would have mm. one. It was sort of like a Cubit ripoff, or, or, or they'd Sour be a Patch shooter, Kids right? Had one, yeah. I, and you know who was into this stuff was uh, uh, the uh, the guy that did Pitfall, Crane, right? Yeah. He did. A, he had a company that did mm -hmm. these, right? And they would work with all these various advertisers to make these little games. Yeah, this could have fit in. You could take this game right now, and it would have worked perfectly as a flash game. You could have played it. Because it's so simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, it literally, there's nothing going on. The music's okay. Yeah. You know, I thought the music was one of the best things about the game, the actually. The music's okay. And the graphics are okay with a butt. My problem with this game, in terms of playing it, it, I like a puzzle game to be pretty crisp when I'm playing it. And this one, it takes the dog a while to get there. Sometimes he falls on his butt and he takes his animation for it. I would rather just have kind of a quicker... I'd really buzz through things a little bit quicker than having to wait. You know, and you know me, I like the things to be slow. This was a little too slow for me. But I, I, w I kept waiting for... Um, I got past the first stage. There are 10 stages. I think each And each stage has 10 levels. Mm -hmm. I, I got past the first one. And I thought, okay, is there going to be a boss battle right, or something? something no. different. The guy, the dog walks across this screen with some ads on it. It says, like, you know, you're going to level two. And mm -hmm. you're like, and then that's it. Right. And so it just never, nothing ever happened to make me want to play it more. Mm -hmm. You know, it, there was not that much incentive to keep going, like you said. Uh, I went ahead and watched the playthrough, and it, I will say it took the, the fellow a good almost hour and a half to get through it. I mean, 100 levels, so you've got to, there's a lot of puzzling. Oh, yeah. This game depends on whether you like the puzzle aspect or not. Mm -hmm. You know? Absolutely. It's not like a Tetris or something where... It's a different sort of game. I mean, I will say it's definitely a, a unique puzzle game. I don't think I've ever played anything quite like it. You know, I wish there was... Honestly, I, I, I kind of wish that they would take any sort of chance out of it, too, and just had the joysticks all... I mean, I had some tr trouble getting to places I didn't think I could get to, and I'd miss. If I thought I could get there and I couldn't, I, it was kind of hard to judge. Now, after a while, it got easier, and I got used to the controls, but as I playing it from the start, it was... Irritating. Yeah. Now, but again, we're showing our modern gamer thing where it wasn't immediately easy, so I hate it. And uh, you know, if you were buying, if this was your one game for the month, that's not a that's not a valid complaint because you're going to spend the time that it takes to get used to these controls. Well, I didn't think it was immediately hard. I will say that I thought the first 
five levels are pretty easy. But I mean, if, the, if you're out of a hundred yachts, which I mean, you're right. But just uh, there wasn't enough entertaining stuff on here to make me want to play it. If you well, if you're not in love with this particular kind of puzzle solving, right. then there's not going to be much for you here. But there, I mean, if you look at reviews on this game, it did not review terribly bad. Like on it, women, it, there's a lot of good. The in fact, the biggest complaint about this game is that it's too easy. It's too easy to beat all well, hundred levels. And I, I would wager that you get used to it. It would be now. It's speaking of the reviews, I, just, I wrote some down, and I'm going to start putting the lemon score in too because the lemon guys do a good job. Yeah, I think they do a pretty good job. They're very fair. So on lemon, this game has a six point nine uh, six out of ten. Not bad. Um, this reviewed pretty uh, mediocre to okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Amiga Action, 84%. Amiga Force, 80 Amiga Format, 78 Amiga Power, 87 uh, AUI, 82 Computers Plus Video Games, 72 So, I mean, they're all in that general area of around the you know, 70s to 80s. No one thought it you know, Amiga There's one gave it eighty three. There's only one score that I care about, and that's the Joker. The, the Joker? Joker I don't have a Joker. Oh. I don't have a score for the Joker. Oh, I'm sure they would have killed it, though. <laughs> um, but, again, what you said is 100% true. If you fall in love with the actual puzzling in it... You know, you ever played Chip's Challenge? No. Chip's Challenge is a, is a kind of a puzzly game, and some people like it, some people don't. Mm -hmm. You know, it just depends if that's, if that's your type of puzzle game. I, I'm not a huge puzzle fan... You know, but occasionally I'll get into one. You know, if you count like stuff like, I don't know, Tetris is a puzzle game. I don't know if I, I guess it sort of is, but it's sure also it twitchy. This isn't twitchy either. I mean, you can take as long as you, I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's a time limit, but it's a pretty generous one. And if, yeah, yeah. And yeah. if you die, there's no, there's no right. game over. No, so, but I mean, uh, and I even watched it, a guy beat it. The ending was suck. No, I'm, so there's I'm no, sure don't, that, yeah. if you're sticking around for 100 levels to see an awesome <laughs> ending, no. It basically is the bare minimum you can put forth to have a puzzle game of some quality. Mm -hmm. Basically, they put their they put the emphasis on the opening, and that's it. Yeah. The rest of it was just generic. This could have been done on any machine. Even the Atari Twenty Six Hundred probably could have done a very ugly version. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very very simple game. Yeah. Uh, looking at the box, it's zany look. And once you show the box to the people, since we actually for once we actually have the box here, you know it's. It's wacky, you know. You've got your, uh, you've got the crazy, well, there's, there's, insane there's a dog. Huge, there's a huge picture of the box. Oh, okay, right yeah. Here, but, yeah. Uh, the, uh, um, you know, it, it, I guess that sort of fits the game. Let's see what else is in here. Um, did they get? Did they have a? It was a catalog. Let's see if there's any goodies. So this is an ocean game. So we've got the manual. The manual's pretty thick, but it's because it's in 19 different languages. Yeah, yeah. It's really um, not that thick. All that, all that. All that else is in here is just the two. This, I guess this is a two-disc game, which yeah. is, two I guess, disc. one disc for the intro and the other disc for the, the actual game. Right, right, right. Um, Colin Curley got replaced uh, eventually, and and he got replaced by a boy named Quentin Quaverhead and his family. Uh, <coughs> apparently, they were in a very, I mean, again, I'm pulling this directly from the I wiki. I can't figure out why none of these UK mascots had any crossover yeah. repeal in the States. Uh, they were in a memorable advertisement shown in 1996. <laughs> it says here it featured Quentin trying to catch a quaver that had blown out of his bedroom window, ending with the slogan, They're floaty light. Ooh. They're floaty light. <laughs> so, <laughs> there you go. So, I looked this up on eBay. And it's, I will say this, this game was well represented all over the planet. Uh, I found someone selling one, 30, $31 shipped complete. It's right here in the good old US of A, if you can believe that. Um, Australia, 50 bucks boxed. The UK, if you want the disc, you're in for an eighter, eight bucks US, 42 bucks or best offer if you're in Germany, US. And then if you're in the UK, you want the box, you've got to have the box. Twenty-seven bucks complete. Wow, not too bad. I want to. I want to just uh, show you. Have you ever watched an advert with uh, with with a, a Quavers advert? Before? I've not. I've never seen one. Okay. I mean, well, I, unless you count the game. So here we go. This is a Quavers ad from 1989 featuring Colin Curley. All right. Okay. So we need to unmute that here, and make sure that it's all right. Here we go. <laughs> Boy, that looks just like a quaver. Oh. <laughs> this, one, this one smells like a quaver. I wonder 
I don't think uh, people at home can hear the audio, unfortunately. You can reenact it. Yeah. That looks like a quaver. That smells like a quaver. I wonder if it tastes like a quaver. There we go. <laughs> Quavers. Watch out, they taste curly. Watch out, they taste curly. If there was ever, a, a, you know, um, a, a tagline, I think that uh, tasting curly, I don't know how one tastes curly, but <laughs> I don't, know, <laughs> I don't right. know if you want to. So w w what do you think about this overall? You want to give a final verdict on it? Did you, did you, would you say go for it? Or? My final verdict is that if you're if you're into puzzle games and you want something that uh, is <laughs> has, a, has kind of a unique mechanic, you know, the diving board mechanic is, is different, um, then it's probably okay, but you should really play Pushover before you attempt this game because Pushover, by all accounts, is the better game. The Pushover too. looks better and it looks more interesting yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And you played it and you liked it. I did. I liked it a lot. Is Even that though, an Amigos play? Uh, yeah, I was. Oh, okay, I great. was. Uh, I was greatly helped by the chat who uh, <laughs> <laughs> frequently <laughs> mocked my skill at Pushover. Well, there you go. But they were they're they're intelligent people over there. Um, all right. Um, so, uh, Aaron. It is time to go on to something that we missed last time. Uh oh. Oh God, no. So it's um, not a quiz. No, no, it's not a quiz. Uh, but we did leave off uh, when we were doing our New Year's Eve show the funniest amigos moment uh, category. The funniest amigos moment. Okay. Uh, I mean, I don't even remember voting on this one. Okay. What What do you got? Okay. Um, anytime Aaron is given a fine whiskey and you just knock it back. Oh damn. <laughs> It's called being a man, y'all. <laughs> Any Lionheart discussion? <laughs> what? Uh, lots of comments about any time I sing the Patreon list. No, oh, man. Um, when I dressed up as green screen man for that Halloween. Was, that was, that was, that's not the funniest moment. That was the most disturbing moment. I had to be right here beside that. Um, Aaron getting a pie in the face. Oh. I mean, Dad had to make the list. Who made this list up? <laughs> These are all what people voted. Oh, no. I hope that doesn't win. I hated Dad. Aaron saying, what the hell was that? After Patreon song in episode 122. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't even know what you're saying in that one, either. you? <laughs> and um, the Duncan song at the end of an episode, where we forgot his name, we sang him a special song in the recent podcast where Aaron mentioned he would be using the podcast to remember his grocery list. <laughs> Man, I'm mentioning a lot of these, and I don't. <laughs> You're a funny guy. Oh what yeah, I'm just, oh yeah. <laughs> what one? That, that it was just people could oh. write in whatever they want. Okay, thank God. <laughs> the pie in the face would would have been funny if it wasn't for the searing pain. <laughs> I mean, uh, I did it for a good cause, but dang, that's man. true. Hat Chad, bro, I buck on my knees with that shot. Who knows? Who, who knows? Who'll be giving you a pie in the face at the oh, end of the next time? Hell pie. no! You got to come up with another gimmick, boat. I gave you that when you only get one. All right, Aaron, it's time to thank our lovely and powerful Patreon mighty. supporters. They're mighty. mighty. Um, so <clears throat> um, if you are interested in becoming a Patreon supporter of Amigos and you would like to be featured on this, this upcoming ditty, uh, just head on over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Amigos Podcast. It rhymes with ditty. Well, if you get what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Level Lord John, Marshall Matthew Perron, Ricky DeRosa, Creepy Dead Boy, The Figgy TCTZ, The Slow Norris, Stephen Sugar, Mortensen. Evan Helen, Blendo 75, Christopher Hassel, Ravi Abba, Chris Foles, Green Catcher, what? Lauren Zorro, <laughs> Grand Bev Key, Brent Downey, Lane Vincent, Adam Battersby, O'Brien's Retro! Styles, Anthony Jarvis, tapes from the crypt, Josh Nam, Will Williams, Adam Bradley, Jonas Rulo, THG, Eric Nelson, K 
him Tommy Humbert stab Daniel Bingston, Brutal Barracuda, Darren Coles Pixels at dawn Kjolbjorn Barman Touching. Thank you. That touched me right here. I don't want to know where there is. In lunch, it was lunchtime. Mm. Wow. Man, I'm glad Tom Petty wasn't around to hear that. What? He's not around anymore? Holy smokes. All right, Aaron. So uh, next week, we're going to play... Um, what are we going to play next week? Do you remember? <laughs> no. Well... I don't have the list. I don't the have the list game. I email you the list every week. You refuse to, you refuse I can't to look remember. at it. I said, did you read the funny moments? I can't remember nothing. Uh, Grocery list? I don't know. I'm going to record how to get to my house so I can find my way home. That might be a bad, not a bad idea. Maybe after the show, we can record a special Amigos video where you detail the instructions to your home <laughs> from here. <laughs> All right, I also want to thank everybody in the chat that's hanging out with us. Uh, let's see, we got uh, Plip, Pip Plop. It's anything hard to yeah. say. Uh, Laurent Giroux, John Marshall, Duncan, Duncan Styles. Uh, Trey Guard, 1982. Where's the Dead Boy at today? Uh, Zerfall. Maybe Creepy Dead Boy didn't get the YouTube memo. Oh, man. Uh, let's see. Sorry, um, Dead Boy. Eric Sundstrom, uh, who gave us the name of that, the, the name of the bird in Swedish. So thank you for that. Sweet. Uh, Jesus Deuce. <laughs> uh, Dazzly. Wow. Uh, so thank you all for hanging out in the chat good with us. Good crowd today. Yeah, good crowd. Um, so uh, you can always watch us live on YouTube. We're back. Every Friday around 5.30ish. Um, we usually record. Except for when we, except for when go we don't. Long, which is almost every time in a pre-show. Yeah. So um, anyway, thank you all for watching. We'll see you next week. Until then, adios. adios.